Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show NOE talk preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not as at Bikini to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I hope that you are having a fantastic weekend. I hope that you had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving surrounded by people that you love and who love you, or at least people that you like well enough to sit around a table with. Sometimes family is who you choose, and that's perfectly okay. I I have a lot of family that I wasn't born related to, as do we all. I am so glad to see that I have our chat rooms both open and both active. If you are somewhere and you want to be able to get in and chat with us, you can go to www.wbhm-db.com and you will see the little thing that says choose to chat. Click on that icon and boom, you are in like Flynn. If you are listening on your mobile device and you're in Spreaker, there's a chat there too. All you have to do is come on in. And I'm sure that you're going to have a lot of questions because our guest tonight is Tom Conwell. Tom is a ufologist. He is someone who has a background in electronics. He is absolutely one of my favorite guests. 
He is someone that I have been talking to for years. We've become friends. His writing is brilliant. His research is impeccable. He has actually written a trilogy of books relevant to UFOs. The The title of the series is They Are Here, and the volume one is East Coast, U.S. Volume two is Central U.S., and volume three is the Western U.S., and he has so much more coming. He actually has another book in the works that he is researching as we speak, and we're going to be discussing that too. And Tom Comwell, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having me, Kat. This is going to be a lot of fun. It is. Well, it always is, but it is going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, one of my favorite things is that you helped me to become educated on the actual craft side of UFOs as opposed to species of potential aliens and things of that nature. I did not realize that there was such a vast array of craft. It is crazy. Yeah, when when you start looking through the databases, um, you'll find uh, probably up to 50 different things described that people are seeing in the sky. Um, In some cases, they are misidentified. um, And I don't mean misidentified as uh, airplanes. I mean misidentified that um, they'll look up and they'll see what might be a sphere in one direction. But if you were to move that sphere a little bit in a different direction and look at it, it's it's really an oval. So there, there's all kinds of things like that. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, there might be nearly 50 of those things. Um, and uh, um, that set me back a whole lot when I first started doing the books because I didn't know what to do with all of them. Wow. You know, you just assume that it's going to be a thing, right? I would not have thought perspective would make such a huge difference either uh, if I were if oh, I were yeah. going through that. I mean, because what I've seen was actually not it didn't look like it could be anything else besides what it was. So and I was quite taken aback at the time, so I was trying to make it be anything else but what it was. Sure. <laughs> so sure. It was disconcerting. But um, that's an interesting perspective because most people don't realize that, you know, it could be oblong, you know, or a pill shape or, you know, anything. That's just bizarre. It it really is strange. Um, if um, I, and I'd recommend that uh, um, your listeners go to uh, the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh, that address is nufoRC dot org, and um, look into the varying states and just read the descriptions, and each one of them. Uh, will will reveal something to you that you probably never realized. Um, it's a real eye-opening experience when you look through the database. Now, whether it's that or the MUFON database, it really is very unique. Well, yes. And I will tell you that I have gone there when I have seen something, whether it was a fireball or whatever. And it's fascinating. I was look, doing some research for a lecture I was going to be giving and just in a very short time span, just in Alabama, we had 19 sightings and only two of those were considered to be mistaken. I was just like, really? 
Yeah. Who would know this? I mean, that is a fantastic site. And you'll be surprised. I am always surprised when I go and look around there. So... Yeah, those those um, those databases are absolutely invaluable. Um, you'll see sightings in there that will um, that will be seen in one city, and seconds later, the same thing is described in a city that might be a hundred miles from it. Now, are they two different things or the same thing? I don't know, but the only way that you can glean any information from this is to put them in some sort of representative uh, picture so that you can see them with your own eyes yes um that's why i do the map it it just it just makes everything um understandable at least in my viewpoint uh, the way i look at things well and i will say that you are one of the most analytical people i know when I say that you're a forensic researcher, I'm not kidding. That is one of the things that you took so much information. You you combined into your map, which I love having your map. It's just, can you tell people about that, about how you came to do the compilations and get the get it down to a manageable for you method. Um, okay. Um, I first started with New York State. This is kind of a long answer. When I did New York State, um, uh, I grabbed just one particular type of sightings. That was a fireball. And I put a, a large black pin on a road map of New York State and realized that I was going to see uh, large chunks of uh, sightings in certain areas. Uh, just by reading through the database, I uh, could basically predict that. So I put a bunch of pins on here on the, um, the, the New York State map and realized that there were groups of sightings um, that stuck out that were closer to the water than not. Um, in other words, there were big clumps of sightings uh, in the Syracuse and North area, which would be up towards Lake Ontario, in the Rochester area, which is right on Lake Ontario, and the Buffalo area and uh, southwest of that, which is – a combination of either Lake Ontario or Lake Erie. And there was huge chunks of sightings in these particular areas. Well, not only that, there was the same huge chunks of sightings in the New York City area. Now, uh, mind you, New York City is a very populous place. And a reasonable person would say, well, that's because there's so many people there. Um, so you really can't draw any conclusions from that. Well, that's what I thought. I really was willing to um, to uh, ignore uh, that I was finding chunks of sightings over cities and look for the ones out in the, out in the countries until I started doing a couple of more maps. The next map I did was the state of Pennsylvania, and I found large chunks of sightings around Philadelphia, um, around um, Harrisburg, and around Pittsburgh, and up towards Erie, PA, which again was right up on Lake Erie. So I thought, well, okay, they're just cities again, except – I was finding sightings in areas where there wasn't a lot of population. So what was I revealing by this? It, it, it was, the whole thing was a really huge puzzle to me. I had no idea what the map was telling me, even though I had an idea that there was something going on. So after I had written my first book and had uh, maybe a couple of maps like – um, New York and Pennsylvania, even though I did like 
uh, probably um, uh, 23 uh, states in the eastern U.S. Even though I had that, I only had two maps. And then I said to myself, I'm leaving something on the table here. I'm leaving the potential for there being patterns all across the United States, either within states, between states, and a whole lot of other scenarios. So what I did was I got a great big map, a 30-inch by 50-inch map. And uh, I think you've seen that one, Kat. I have seen that one. Yeah, and um, I started putting uh, small pins in this map. Um, and realized that I was seeing the same kind of patterns um, across the states in the central U.S. Remember, I didn't do the eastern U.S. The central U.S. Um, that I was seeing in the maps of New York and Pennsylvania. That's what clued me in to the fact that there are patterns going on. I didn't know what the patterns were, but I knew that they were there because I could sort of see things um, uh, happening in just the central U.S. So I went back after I had written volume two. I went back and uh, added in all the pins for the eastern U.S. That's when I realized that there was a tie-in mm -hmm. between states in the, in the different areas. In other words, a tie-in between – um, Ohio, which was in volume two, yes. and Kentucky, which was in volume one. And Kentucky is right on the border, a, a good long portion of the border of Ohio. And um, there, were, there were groups of sightings and almost lines of sightings uh, between the two states. If you were to go into the National UFO Reporting Center and look at the sighting reports, you only get one state at a time, mm -hmm. and you miss all the, all the potential interactions between states. That's why I did it, because I realized with one of the sightings that there was, there was a bunch of things seen across – where was it? Uh, Illinois – and then all of a sudden, it showed up in Kentucky. Now, I never would have seen that because Illinois and Kentucky are two separate databases. I never would have known it had I not seen one particular sighting that got my interest. And I happened to go into Kentucky when I was putting pins on the map and noticed it was the same date and time. There's a whole lot of these across the United States, a whole lot of them. Now, the other thing that keyed my interest was um, if, let's say for instance, if this is an extraterrestrial civilization and they are looking at our planet and they want to know what they're flying over, what's the land like, what type of water, what are the resources, the minerals um, – they may even be looking at whether um, the people that live on our planet are becoming um, uh, aware, uh, open-minded uh, toward them. These are things that because the extraterrestrials are so incredibly open-minded, they may be able to fly over an area and just by their um, – their mental prowesses, they may be able to tell that. Maybe that's what they're doing. I had no idea what they were doing. But I also, at the same time, realized that if they're going to be flying over, they're not going to be on over Boston one night and Seattle the next night and uh, San Antonio the third night. Th that would be illogical. They would want to go back and forth across the country either horizontally or vertically, to make sure they're not missing anything. That's logical to me, but we have to stop because okay. we're at a break. Okay, and very good. this is fascinating. This is meat and potatoes 
I love it. And we will be right back. Thank you all for being here and we will catch you on the flip side. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um... Nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. To the believer, the evidence is overwhelming. To the skeptic, there will never be enough. Hello everyone. Join Kevin and Jennifer Malik, the host of Paraversal Universe, every Friday here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCET-FM and The Rift. Log on or tune in as they check out the mysteries found within the eight categories of the unknown and unexplained, including ghosts and haunted places, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, cryptids and monsters, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, metaphysics, and forbidden archaeology. Listen as Kevin and Jennifer interview the top minds in their respective fields as they share theories and information regarding these unsolved mysteries. For future show and archive information, one can find Paraversal Universe on Facebook, Twitter, and MeWe under various Paraversal Universe headings. So, for excellent talk radio about the unknown and unexplained, check out Paraversal Universe, where all paranormal perspectives apply. Brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society, LTV, and produced by WBHMDB.com. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. I am so excited to have Tom Conwell here. And Tom, I interrupted you. I apologize for that, but... It is just a schedule thing. <laughs> but we were discussing how you had to go back and look at the placement on your map to ascertain that these things were actually occurring across the board, like within, like sequentially, whether mm-hmm. north and south or east to west. Were you shocked when you started finding these incidents that were multi-area obviously maybe a movement of a group of ufos and did it ever appear to you that that these were more more of a reconnaissance group than individual okay um first of all i wasn't shocked i expected it um, because of the kinds of sightings that I was seeing, mm-hmm. um, you know, ships would be in one area of a city, and then um, when you look down the list of uh, of the reports, you're going to find them in another um, another area of the same city, uh, and maybe one other time that they're seen out in the country. Now, these may be within several minutes of each other or like almost seconds of each other. Um, So I expected that to occur. My difficulty was there were so many of them that I couldn't find 
those particular lines, whether they be horizontal or vertical or diagonal or whatever the deal happened to be, I couldn't find them because there were just too many. Mm -hmm. Um, So um, I put that on the back burner. Um, So um, these these groups of sightings that were occurring – they, uh, even though they occurred in cities that may be uh, at the same latitude um, uh, or, and in some cases, the same longitude, you never know which way that they're going. Um, I still couldn't put my finger on what was happening. I didn't know and I didn't have the I didn't have the uh, data uh, for it and didn't know how to take the data apart uh, within the actual database and print out straight lines. Mm -hmm. It was extremely difficult because they were coming in from all over the place almost at the same time. So again, I put that on the back burner. And it wasn't until I started looking at the earthquake things, which is my newest book, that I started seeing those patterns. It was very interesting, very interesting. Um, we'll we'll talk about that later. Absolutely. But, but um, um, I loved the idea that I knew that there was some sort of pattern going on. I knew it. There had to be. Um, Because if you're going to look at a very large area, it wouldn't make sense to look at it haphazardly or randomly because you're going to miss places. And I don't care how good your computers are. You're just going to be all over the place and and, and miss things. Um, And you are not a haphazard or random person. Uh, I, I'm not, no. no. And it would only make logic uh, to me that there would have to be in some sort of fixed pattern, yes. night after night after night. And um, again, I had to put that on the back burner until I started my latest book. Which I cannot wait for you to complete. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that I have found and – We've talked several times. I love these conversations. And we we are friends away from the interview process. So that's, I learned so much from you. But when you get a clue that there is something going on, you are, you are on it. What you are looking for now is truly something that, I've heard people give it lip service, but I don't know anyone else that has done the legwork on this research. And you are just, you have just, you dove in, you are pulling all of this. Where are you going primarily to get this research? Because I know that while you're doing the sightings, you're using other information to connect these. So are you do are you using oh please I just lost the word the um the reports that are saying okay well you know we're having this activity in this you know this seismic activity in this area this seismic activity here and at what point do you find there's activity Am I jumping um, the gun too much? Well, um, um, I didn't know you were going to get into earthquakes, which is fine. <laughs> but Well, um, you brought it up, and yeah, I thought, true. well, you know, okay. this is something that is, is fresh for you. All of it is. You're always on top of things because you're a constant presenter. People love to hear your information. But do you want to wait to do the earthquakes a little bit? Yeah. Um, and- yeah, only okay. because um, uh, in order to look at this whole thing, I had to I had to consider 
um, first of all, where the quakes are, whether mm-hmm. they're big or small, map all of those, look at sightings several days before, the day of, and several days after. It, it was a whole sequence of events that I had to do, um, and that's what revealed new information to me. So well, we um, will just I, follow your flow. I am totally good with that. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Yay. Okay. Um, Because I didn't mean to throw you out of sequence. And I know that for some of the work that you do for first time listeners to you, they probably would work better with, with the pacing and the understanding of where this information came from. What led you to this? That, that's the only way to understand what I'm trying to do. Yes. Um, because if you come in in the middle and and say, well, gee, did you do this or do that? Well, you, if you had followed what I said from from the first sentence, then you'd have known that I did that. <laughs> you know, it, 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 <laughs> well, you know me. I, I do know your history, and I am jumping the gun. I apologize. But... So here you are, you're finding this information. It's like pulling teeth, trying to get it lined up until you're using your map and getting everything isolated. Where do you go? Okay. Um, uh, First of all, the sightings. The sightings are all done from the National UFO Reporting Center. Mm -hmm. Um, I do not use MUFON, and the reason I don't is because I was shut down by them when I asked them to share their database, and they said no. Really? Um, Now, that was before um, several people have asked uh, since then, and they received a whole whole bunch of information from MUFON. If I ask again, I, I may get a different answer. But right now, if I do that, then I have to go back and redo all of my data together and uh, reintegrate it. And that's going to take me about a year and a half. Yes. And that would slow down what I have. Um, I certainly wouldn't be able to write another book, um, not for quite some time. And um, I just – I just didn't want to do it because all of a sudden I would come up with with a whole lot more sightings, even though that might be the best thing to do. Um, it may skew everything that I'm doing. So I really wanted to stay with what I had and uh, just work with that. Can I ask a question here? Oh, sure. Please do. Well, if you were to come up with many more sightings and you felt that it would – skew things a bit do you feel that MUFON gets more information than the UFO reporting center or are they just different experiencer type of things or why why do you feel that they would be so different um, well, it, it w- wouldn't be different. It would just be more of the same, and it would probably it probably give it to me in a little different format that I'm that I had uh, um, worked through mm-hmm. previously. So I'm going to have to convert it to the to the way that I'm looking at the data. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it would just be very very long and tedious. Gotcha. I, don't believe that I would get data that's any different than what I have. I would just receive more of it. I would, I would agree with that. So um, I made the decision early on that I wasn't going to, um, I wasn't going to accept uh, more data um, from uh, MUFON um, because it would just put me way back behind the eight ball again. And basically that's, I do agree with the time because it's not that one organization is better or they're different. And I do feel that you would find the numbers to be similar. Sure. Um, There's um, uh, Cheryl Costa did Mm -hmm. uh, 
tremendous amount of work um, utilizing uh, both databases. She was able to get um, she was able to get MUFON and NUFORC um, and do the work on it initially all together. Um, I started in with NUFORC um, probably about 12 months before Cheryl started, and then I would have to go back and reintegrate everything. I wasn't going to do it. I, there, there were so many sightings. I had uh, almost 80,000 sightings to work with. Isn't so, that astounding? Yeah. If if I were to um, add MUFON to it, I may add another uh, maybe forty or 50,000 to it. That is so astounding. I, yeah, there's just so many that I don't think it would affect uh, the kind of data that I was seeing. As a matter of fact, it would make it harder to see what I'm seeing um, because there'd be more pins in a map and less of a chance of a uh, of a pattern because mm-hmm. there'd be nothing but pins. <clears throat> well, it's pretty close now. Uh, it is. There's a lot in, of pins in this in, map, and in, but they in some represent, areas, yes, yes, in, but they represent in, specifics. So I do understand what you're saying, and I agree. Yeah, and and I I didn't want to do that. I I wanted to include the MUFON sightings, but um, I probably just caught them at the wrong time um, before anyone. Um, um, started putting things together and I uh, um, that's when I got my no answer so I figured well okay I have what I have let me just go with it I mean and there was 80,000 of them um, I certainly wasn't going with like 20 you know it was 80,000 um, now so- you had a good compilation of information there you had what most people would have been daunted by. Uh, it, it was it was rough. It really was. And yet you stuck that out. I am just so impressed with... Because I would have been a little bit thrown by the sheer volume. And when you actually started seeing your patterns and started doing the research you know, compiling states, bringing the patterns together. That just was so overwhelming when I'm studying you that I was impressed. I, yeah, when, that, I still think your work is brilliant. Well, thank you. When I put my map together, um, <clears throat> I put the map away for about two months I was still writing um, volume three and wrote volume three and realized that what was happening was there were areas that that um, were popping up where there seemed to be way more sightings than I would uh, that I would expect there to be normal normally. Some, you know, people look up in the sky, oh, you're going to see 30 airplanes and half of them are going to be misidentified. You know, there's just going to be a bunch of that stuff. But I saw large areas uh, out in the country that were, um, uh, that had uh, groups of sightings. And when I was writing volume three, I identified those areas and then added that to what I was writing in Volume 3 um, and described each of the areas that were um, unusual in, in uh, quantity of sightings and looked at various things in that area, like if there's any earthquake activity, if there's, if there's um, uh, any plate activity. If there uh, happened to be uh, large amounts of pollution, I looked at absolutely everything for these these strange areas. And uh, this was about the time, that even though I was doing research on Volume 3, I still hadn't completed Volume 2. 
It hadn't been uh, mm-hmm. sent to the printer. So I thought, I'm not leaving this information on the table for volume two. So I went through volume two and circled areas that were really unusual. And I included that in volume two's area with each state that I looked at. Um, so it, one, one thing that I did uh, opened up the door for multiple other things in other, other areas. And it became one thing after another and almost to the point that – it was like getting hit with a, a rogue wave. I mean, that's just what it was like. It was just overwhelming. Wow. Well, we have questions, but I'm going to hold these off until we get to the top of the hour because they're a little bit off subject. But mm-hmm. when, um, what did you, what did you do? I mean, I know that you said it was like a rogue wave. I know you were feeling overwhelmed. Did you just square your shoulders and get back down to it? Or did you have to take a break for a bit? Um, Well, I broke it down into various things that I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at all of the different areas in all of the different states and why they were unique and uh, do the research on each one of them. I made a long list and started with in with the first one on the list and worked my way through it. And that took about three months, I guess, mm-hmm. to, to go through that. Um, then I went back to volume three and started, uh, started to complete the area uh, that I was writing about. And at the same time, I sent volume two out to the printers. So I have all these things going at the same time. So volume three, um, uh, let's see, what did I do? I I didn't want to get myself ahead of uh, volume two by including something in volume three that wasn't in two because I had already done that when I found all these uh, strange areas that were that – were, uh, groups of sightings I did not include in volume one. And I had to go back and re-release that book Mm -hmm. uh, with volume one. So I I didn't want to do too much and I get uh, get ahead of myself. So um, I slowed down, looked at what I had, wrote down long lists of all the to-do things. And um, I started in with um, number one and Went to number 100, and that's, that's basically all that I can tell you. I, I just had to do it sequentially because if I didn't write them down, I would have forgotten. This is just amazing. We are at our second break, and we will be right back. Thank you all for listening. I know you all are fascinated, and we will be right back with Tom after this. You are listening to WBHM. Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting.
You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. I am Kat Hobson, your host, with my guest, Tom Comwell, and I have been taking him out of sync with his experiences, and I have apologized, so we are going to move on, and Tom, thanks for your patience, and I am, you know, I'm I'm just fascinated. I get ahead because I'm like, oh, this is so cool, but when you, when you were sitting there trying to go back and a sign, not a sign, but understand what was happening. You had to step back so that you weren't over extending, I guess, the research so that you were keeping the information uniform for the, the volumes so that you were comparing apples to apples and not apples to zebras, Right. Yeah, that's uh, that was that was the one thing that I would not allow myself to do, and that would be to take the database and do something different with it with each book, because then I couldn't say, well, Maryland has the same kind of things happening as uh, Colorado, you know, mm-hmm. because there would be different things, and I could not compare them. So I had to do exactly the same thing with the entire database in every state and um, write about it in the same way. It, it drove me nuts. I I can see that. I I would have probably gone ahead and then I would have read that decision. So you're doing this, but you're still seeing things that are not – the same or things that are not you're finding new information that's not included in the first two volumes so you're compiling this are you going back already and looking at the first two areas or are you just getting it um getting it grooving with the volume three and then planning to come back and do everything um well because volume two kind of overlapped volume three, I was able to do the same thing with volume two and volume three at the same time okay. and not not get too much out of sync. I did have a problem with volume one. One of the other things I added, because I was kind of curious, is not only was I uh, looking at the kinds of sightings that were happening in certain areas – I also wanted to look at the whole state annually. And that was from 19, whenever their first um, reported sighting happened to be. Sometimes it's as early as 39, and other times it's uh, as late as 1952. But I used all of those in a great big, one great big map, not map, um, uh, one great big uh, Excel spreadsheet, and I could see what was happening with each year from 19, excuse me, from 2016 right back through uh, maybe 1939. And every single state has that exact same look about it. I had no idea if I was going to find something there. None. But I wanted to do the same thing for everyone so that it had the same data and you could compare one state to another. Mm -hmm. I found something I didn't expect to see. In 1960, there were a couple of sightings in a particular year, or maybe three or four more the next year, two or three less than that the year after. But in one of the years in 1960s, 1961, excuse me, 60 through 69, I saw a little spike of sightings. Well, okay. I saw that in one state. 
that I just happened to be looking at. I saw the same thing in the 70s and wondered, well, what am I seeing here? Um, is this just uh, uh, data that just has a spike and I can uh, ignore it? Or is there some reason for it? So I started comparing every single state that I did. In every single state, every one, there was a, a small spike in the 60s, one spike in the 60s, and one spike in the 70s. Now, if I had seen that in random amounts, and some some states have four spikes and other states have zero, you know, that I would expect to be randomness. Right. But because I saw one spike in almost every state in the 60s and in the 70s, and I could compare one to the other, I could look at where the spikes happen to be. I put that on a map and looked to see where large areas had the spikes. Uh, in some of them, in the 60s, I saw maybe an area where with about, oh, maybe 15 or 20 states that had the same spike in the same year. That's significant. That is um, significant. Yeah. Now, I found the same thing in the 1970s. The 1980s became randomized. So I didn't know what I was looking at then. Um, and to this date, I still haven't found any direct uh, link to uh, groups of sightings in areas or whatever. But the 60s and the 70s, I saw large areas of the country that had spikes in the same year. And I thought that was very interesting. Maybe that's when these craft or whatever were going over and – surveying or scanning our, our our planet looking for who knows what they're looking for. I didn't know that for certain, but I thought it was interesting and that's one of the things I noted and spoke about in, um, in uh, the various talks that I do mm -hmm. and I also showed the maps. That was kind of cool because you'd see uh, 15 or 20 states in one great big old area that all had the same spike in the same year. I just thought that was really interesting. But well, it is. And when you saw those spikes, it wasn't like in the time frame, I guess, specifically, or you would have seen this. I know you would have. Where, like, we were doing nuclear things, like when they were messing with Minot and the other Air Force bases and stuff like that was... So you ruled out things of that nature. Um, because there were so many areas that had them, um, I couldn't rule it in or rule it mm -hmm. out. Okay. Um, it, 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 was, it was just, well, there's some here and there's some not here. So, and, and both of them had a spike in the same spike in the same year. So, you know, I, uh, the, there was just too many variables that I couldn't put my finger on. It's just so diverse. I think that's pretty interesting. And I love when when anomalies like that rear their heads. It's it's fun. It's, it's, it's an aha moment, you know. Um, I love aha moments. And I can actually picture you literally. Aha! <laughs> yeah, I, I usually <laughs> run into the to the uh, room where my wife is and hey look what I just found I get all excited about all this data and she looks at me well that's nice <laughs> 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 but I was excited anyhow you know well I'm sure she was for you too because she is very supportive that's I think that's one of the best things is having somebody to go and yell aha to uh, yeah, and and I I had my biggest moment in volume two when I started talking about um, the time after uh, after the last great flood mm -hmm. when uh, populations were just starting to to sprout 
um, and the, mostly the Native American populations, and they told stories about um, um, about people coming out of the water and teaching them um, uh, things about society and um, uh, food preparation and things like that. And it turned out that I saw the same thing in Africa, India, um, in uh, the Middle East, in uh, Australia. And they all told stories about people who were half man, half fish coming out of the water and teaching them the that same story all the way across wow. the world. The same stories about the same people at about the same time. Just when populations were starting to starting to sprout um, and um, uh, uh, people were, were having trouble uh, making it. But – all these stories about all these different areas, all at the same time, all across the whole world. Helping them to survive. Yeah, that was my biggest aha moment. I went, what is going on here? That is Who huge. Who are these people? Yeah, I know. I know. Um, so I caught up my good friend, um, um, uh, Dr. Rita Louise. Ah, she's um, brilliant. And, yeah. Oh. Brilliant. Unbelievable. And yes. I said, I can't believe what I just found and told her this. And she said, did you read my book about such and such? I went, well, yeah, I did. Look at about page, uh, whatever in the page. And she says, I talked about some of the areas in, um, in India and Africa and uh, the Middle East. Go compare that with what you just told me. So I went back and went, that's all my information. <laughs> she beat me to it. That's not fair. But um, um, I absolutely love her. Uh, I do too. And it, we, we've been friends for years. And um, uh, she helps me at, at the drop of a hat. All I have to do is ask. And uh, she's right there for me. She's that kind of woman. Yep. That kind of human. Yes, she is. Yeah, her and... Um, uh, Marie D. Jones. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, Marie has given me more help than I could count on two hands. Well, I'll tell you that um, she is one of my heroes. They both are. Oh, yeah. And I am, I was very flattered. Marie included one of my stories in one of her books. Oh, so cool. I, I absolutely enjoy her anyway. So it was even even more flattering when she did that. Yeah. But so Rita had your information. That is so yep. wild. And she the same thing, fish people. Mm -hmm. That's just bizarre. Oh, I know it is. I know it is. Um as an aside, um in volume three, um the foreword of this book was written by Marie Jones. Brilliant. And uh, she, she's been just wonderful to me. Absolutely well, because wonderful. because she's a good person. And she's always willing to help. She's kind. Mm-hmm. Busy. Busy as a uh, one-armed paper hanger. Oh, my God. Kind. I don't know how she does it. I don't either. Yeah. Constant writing, whether it's screenplays, books. She usually has two or three books. She's got um, at least going at one time. And I like it because anytime that I'm starting to feel like I'm a little overwhelmed, I'll see her and she's like, writing. I'm a writer. <laughs> writing. And I'm like, yes. Okay. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But she is one of my heroes, and I know she is one of yours, too, but she, she is kind. And you know what? We are up to our news break, and we're going to have to take this. This is going to be a good time. If you have a beverage that needs to be refilled, this is your moment. It's good. And you know what? Maybe we'll luck out, and we'll find a little good news. 
I'm not saying it's impossible, right? We always have that hope. But y'all come back. We will be right back with Tom Comwell. He is one of my favorite authors and researchers. And we are going to be talking about the information leading up to his new book. So y'all come right back. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Windsor Johnston. The House Intelligence Committee will begin reviewing a report on Monday, summarizing the findings of the impeachment inquiry into President Trump. As NPR's Bobby Allen reports, the Democratic Control Committee is expected on Tuesday to advance the findings to the Judiciary Committee, which will consider drafting articles of impeachment. The impeachment inquiry is about to enter a new phase, from finding facts to considering the law. The Judiciary Committee has scheduled a Wednesday hearing in which constitutional scholars will talk about what makes an impeachable offense. The White House hasn't said yet whether it will participate, but Representative Doug Collins, the ranking Republican on the Judiciary Committee, said on Fox News Sunday that he wants to call House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff as his first witness. I really question his veracity and what he's putting in his report. I question his, you know, the motives of why he's doing it. It's easy to hide behind a report, but it's going to be one another thing to actually get up and have to answer questions. Schiff hasn't said whether he would comply, but he says he would have nothing valuable to offer the Judiciary Committee. Bobby Allen, NPR News, Washington. The U.S. Supreme Court is scheduled to take up its first major gun rights case in a decade. NPR's Nina Totenberg reports the justices on Monday will hear arguments on now-defunct gun regulations in New York City. Several gun owners and the New York affiliate of the NRA challenged regulations for having a handgun at home in New York City. Under the regulations, as they existed when the case began, a license to have a gun at home only allowed the gun owner to transport the weapon to seven shooting ranges inside the city limits. That meant these pistol owners could not transport their guns to a home elsewhere in the state, for instance, or to shooting ranges and competitions outside the city. This year, the city changed those rules to be more permissive. But the gun owners are pressing the Supreme Court to lay out yet more permissive rules for gun ownership and transport. Nina Totenberg, NPR News, Washington. Nearly six out of ten companies in the S&P 500 index are at risk of losing assets because of climate change. NPR Scott Horsley reports that's according to a new guide for climate-savvy investors. The guide evaluates some 15,000 companies around the world to see which are most exposed to a changing climate. Many of those companies have assets at growing risk of physical damage from wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, or other problems associated with rising carbon in the atmosphere. Analysts also flag businesses that could be adversely affected by regulatory changes, such as a carbon tax. Those risks are higher in the U.S. and Australia than in other countries, which have already adopted more aggressive policies to combat climate change. Even companies in the same industry often have widely varying exposure to climate risk. The assessments were conducted by True Cost, which is an arm of S&P Global. Scott Horsley, NPR News, Washington. This is NPR. Police in New Orleans continue to investigate a shooting overnight that left 11 people injured. Authorities say the incident took place on the edge of the city's French Quarter. One person has been detained for questioning. No arrests have been made. Zimbabwe is joining the rest of the world in commemorating World AIDS Day. The country, which at one point had the highest HIV prevalence rate in the world, has made significant progress against the pandemic. But Ishma Fanduko reports the current chaos in the public health delivery system is threatening to reverse some of those gains. Almost 90% of Zimbabweans living with HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, are on antiretrovirals. In the capital Harare, nurses who dispense the medication at city council clinics have been on strike since early last month. Director of Health Services, Dr. Prosper Chonzi, says this is cause for great concern. So we find a lot of patients now defaulting. If you're in ARVs, to default for two weeks, you probably will create resistance. In addition to antiretrovirals, some of those living with HIV often require other medical services as they are prone to conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. For NPR News, I'm Ishma Fundikwa in Harare. Federal aviation officials are investigating a plane crash in South Dakota. Nine of the 12 people on board were killed. The plane went down in snowy weather shortly after takeoff on Saturday. The plane was traveling to Idaho Falls. 
This is NPR News. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. And yes, we are the online voice of Fate Magazine. If you have not got your subscription up to date, you know what? You can do that. All you have to do is visit FateMag.com, get there. You can also listen to our show and participate in our chat over on that website as well as WBHMDBs. And there is so much information over there. You can see old volumes. There are a lot of those that are available. And, you know, one of the things that I like the best is that our editor, Phyllis, knows everything we had um in fact tom you'll appreciate this cheryl costa had written a book and a uh, written a story and submitted it to fate and had no idea that it had been published in fact had you know wondered why it was not well come to find out when she got to the excuse me, got to the information, I sent a message to Phyllis and said, you know, I was just curious about this. And she said, well, we did publish that. She knew it. And she sent two hard copies out to Cheryl so that she could have them. I thought that was really a cool thing. Yes. Yeah, really. So, you know, Fate, Fate Mag Radio and Fate Magazine are just wonderful, wonderful things. And they're both thanks to to Phyllis Scotty. And I am so thankful to her for doing the work that she does. And now we are back with you, Tom. And I am I am so excited to get on with your experience as you're coming through here. You know, we were talking about how across the globe, really, following the Great Flood, the last Great Flood, that there are tales in every civilization about people coming out of the water to basically give information on how to survive, how to restart civilization. Yeah, uh, that's that's really uh, almost... Beyond belief. It's Um, odd. I was unaware of that. What I did was, this is in volume two. um, I tried to compare certain areas with the same kind of terminology that was used in the ancient writings. Right. So, um, um. For half man, half fish, in the Sumerian um, languages, they talked about the word abgal, or seven sages, or fish-like men. In uh, Africa, the Dogon talked about the master of waters. The Hindu was Vishnu, that appeared to them in the form of a fish, and Anishinaabe which are the uh, the Algonquin tribe mm-hmm. from way back, um, they came across as half man, half fish. Now, the next term is iridescent. The Sumerians, um, uh, they called uh, the people the shining ones. The Hindu, they said they were golden in color. The Anishinaabe, which again is the Algonquins, Mm -hmm. radiant and iridescent. The Sioux, golden eagle and golden feathers. And the Natchez tribe, bright and may have come from the sun. These are all in their ancient writings and stories passed down uh, through the ancestors. 
seven yeah, gods. I didn't realize where some of those were. I, I, I did read that. I just didn't dawn on me that that was a global connection. Mm-hmm. Um, well, as soon as I saw a connection in two places, that's when I thought, well, what's going on here? That's when I called uh, Rita. Mm-hmm. Rita, Rita Louise, and, and she said, uh, pay attention, Tom. You read my book, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's so funny. She is funny. Okay. And uh, the next term is seven gods. In uh, the Sumer um, languages, they talked about seven sages or demigods. The Dogon tribe, seven amphibious creatures. The Hindu, seven great sages, seven stars of the Big Dipper. The Anishinaabe, seven Megis, M-I-I-G-I-S. And they also referred to the Megis as half man, half fish. The Sioux, seven tribes, seven gods, seven fireplaces, seven council fires. All all these things are just repetitive through uh, the stories passed down. Egg-shaped. In the Dogon, they talked about the cosmic egg. The Hindu talked about the cosmic egg of gold. The Anishinaabe talked about the turtle shell or mm-hmm. egg-like. Yeah. And, and the Anishinaabe also uh, talked about the entire world was created on the back of a turtle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the Sioux talked about heavenly origin. Distance versus time. Now, I tried to put these in some sort of sequence. From the Sumerian, the Iraq was 4,000 uh, BCE, uh, which is right after the flood. The Dogon tribe was approximately 4,000 BCE, and it was 3,100 miles away. The Hindu, um, 4,000 BCE, uh, post flood, which is 2,300 miles from, a Sumer, uh, from the Sumer. The Anishinaabe, um, 4,000 BCE, post-flood, 5,800 miles away. Mm -hmm. And the Sioux in Minnesota, 6,300 miles away. So they all happen at the same time, talking about the same things, talking about the same languages to describe um, the people that helped them. Astounding. It really, really is astounding. And uh, I would also – I'm not in the, in the business of selling other people's books, but if <laughs> any of your listeners are interested, um, Dr. Rita Louise has a couple of books uh, that are just yes. incredible. She certainly does. And, you know, I just find it so fascinating that that is who you reached out to. Not remembering that she also had that information. Somewhere in your little psyche, you did remember that. (laughs) Yeah, I I must have remembered something. The mind is a brilliant Um, thing. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, By the way, one of Rita Louise's books is The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods. Yep. Um, That's a dandy. It Um, is indeed. Some of her books are heavy into um, history and give a lot of references. And she keeps referencing things back to varying um, uh, things that occurred in, 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 in uh, peoples with other languages. And it takes a little while to get used to. And once you know the terms, then you'll realize how closely everything interacts it, it's really amazing when you when you uh, read her stuff and she is also a brilliant researcher she is not writing this off the cuff oh so no she is she knows her stuff i just find that amazing i don't think there's anyone better mm. yep. i think that i think that you may be right and I have interviewed a lot of authors on a lot of topics. She is very diverse and very knowledgeable about every subject she writes on. So, uh, yes, she is. But, you know, I just find, I just find this so unusual 
because, you know, we're talking the Sioux tribes. People probably don't know that they go back that far because, you know, the bridges and obviously, you know, they couldn't possibly have been here. The Algonquin, which are in, you know, northeast up into Canada. And, you know, it just is fascinating to me that this is a global phenomenon. Um, it should, if anything piques your interest, it's this particular subject that should pique your interest because it, it, it demonstrates how interrelated the entire thing about um, the extraterrestrial gods happens to be. It's yes. all interrelated. And, you know, they didn't just go to one area to try to save humanity there. They went everywhere trying to help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people were not so well, they weren't so convinced that they didn't need help that they turned away or ran away. I mean, mm -hmm. seriously, you've got this coming out of the water. You're going to be questioning things. And so it just, to me, is fascinating because people were willing to accept that help. I don't see that happening so much today. Yeah, I don't either. Um, somebody will light, light somebody up if they walk in on them, you know. Um, it it really wouldn't be a good scenario. Well, even if you're scared and you realize that you're going to starve to death and, you know, how are, how are we going to manage to bring anything back, you still would be afraid. You, you sure would. Um, I would. I would be really curious to know how they tried to approach um, uh, some, some of the people, the ancient peoples, because – um, in many cases, they wouldn't know their language, and they would have to demonstrate everything. It, it, it would just be an incredible job, a uh, task uh, to do this uh, with all these different kinds of people. It, it's, you know, not only that, but they, you know, you hear people talk about reptilians, right? And here you have scaly, iridescent glowing fish in an egg that's a little freaky uh, you, you know, bet I, it is and yet people still were willing to take the information and the help pretty cool different mindsets yep. different mindsets yep. willing to accept so I just love that and you know, one of the things that that I appreciate is the fact that this is not something that really is, is you know, a normal thing. Sherry says that, you know, it may sound strange, but all this talk is changing her opinion on aliens. Maybe they're here to help us. Maybe we shouldn't be afraid. Even if something that doesn't look maybe like what we're expecting, mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah, with if, that. if if they wanted to take us out, they'd have taken us out years ago. Um, they wouldn't want to mess with our nuclear weapons or anything. They'd have just they'd have just uh, spread a virus on our planet, uh, killed off ninety percent of the people, then moved in and uh, take everything they wanted. Uh, so they aren't in the business of taking over planets, they're in the business of incorporating other planets into, um, into a uh, integrated nation of uh, civilizations throughout the universe. That's my take on it, too. And, Dadgummit, yep. we have a break. <laughs> I can't believe we're already at a break. But we will be right wow. back, and we are going to continue this conversation so thanks so much. We will catch you on the flip side. 
You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yeah, presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capitol account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio on WBHM Digital Broadcasting with my guest, Tom Comwell. And Tom, I'm going to toss a couple of these questions out, excuse me, because I was going to do them at the top of the hour and I would like to go ahead and get them answered so that we can move on and they do need to be answered. Um, One of them is, what, is there a story relevant to aliens that you consider to not just be lore, but be factual? One of the things that uh, keeps keeps popping up when when they talk about um, uh, alien abductions and things along these lines is uh, people remembering uh, what what they've seen, and I'm not so certain that what people are seeing is what's real. I think uh, uh, in some cases. Um, what is what what people report as having seen uh, has been implanted in their mind, and it may not be real. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, at the same time, it may not be aliens. In some cases, I believe that our government is involved in a little bit of this stuff. To what extent, I do not know. I don't have any data on that, but. I would not be surprised if um, they are into the abduction scenario also. 
Um, but one of the things that I've always wanted to um, to talk about, and I have purposely not allowed myself to talk about it, and that is um, that um, when people are abducted, they're found by the ships in the sky for some particular reason. Either, uh, either they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I guess that's possible, but I don't think that's very likely because I don't think that uh, uh, a super advanced civilization is, uh, is in the randomness um, unless they're they're picking random people at times to look at um, or compare them, uh, compare these people to the the target people, uh, and and use it in some sort of database for comparison. That's one scenario. But um, the one thing that I can absolutely say um, that I have seen in my um, in my abduction interviews is that the majority of the people that are grabbed and taken away and they do whatever to them, these people are also psychic. I believe that's how they find them. Um, I believe that the ships that are visiting have people on them that are extraordinarily psychic and they pick up on these things as they fly over uh, different areas. Um, I would not also be surprised if um, that is one of the things that they're doing as they fly over our country and every other country in the world is they're looking at the level to which the population has been awakened. Um, um, That's interesting. I feel pretty confident in that. Um, I don't think that these ships are flying over top of us to try to track where the water is or to steal our gold or anything else like that. There's, there's enough asteroids in the, in the asteroid belt um, that you can uh, go up there and not have to uh, worry about our stupidity and take as much as you wanted. So I don't think it has anything to do with resources. I think it has to do with people. People is, are their resource. Um, and they're, I believe, um, looking at us and trying to judge at what point we have been awakened and is this the point at which they can announce themselves. That's 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 the one thing that I think should sort of reach out into every single abduction story, um, that exact same thread. Um, I would not be surprised if that were true. That's interesting. Well, I'm going to put Sherry's question out. Um Relevant to elementals, do you feel that elementals are extraterrestrial? And she has a second thing that she just threw out there. Why do you think that the government hides things? Okay. Uh, let me write both those down. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, the elementals... Are they extraterrestrials? I'd say no. I believe what they are, what they may be, is extra dimensionals. Mm -hmm. um, they have come to our planet because they've been here their entire uh, existence. And um, they may indeed travel to other planets through other dimensions, entirely possible. But they're not extraterrestrials and what we think as uh, terrestrial beings are. Um, in many cases, they are, um, they are something akin to uh, ghosts um, and 
they also have the ability to um, to uh, 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 put themselves into our dimension so that they're visible and um, they uh, they can also communicate in certain ways. Uh, but I feel pretty pretty confident in saying that elementals are interdimensionals. Okay. Um, now, why does the government hide things? Okay, that's one of my favorite subjects. Um, um, let me give you a little example of why they hide things. Let's say, for instance, that they, um, at the urging of the population, decide to tell everybody that extraterrestrials are visiting us, that um, they've had a couple of ships that have crashed. We have been able to um, glean some of their technology. We found things like um, – we found things like uh, uh, unlimited power uh, that we can power the ships uh, and – uh, get up into space just like they can. Let's just say that that information came out. What would the population say to, uh, interesting, so you have unlimited power? Well, yes, uh, we use it in our ships. Oh, so could you use this power for the good of all, all the people on, in the world? Well, uh, I'm sure we could. If they use this power and it's unlimited, the cost would be zero, correct? And free. Yeah, and free. So everybody would be saying, wait a minute. I've been paying for power for the last 30 to 50 years at – Two, three, four hundred dollars a month, and you happily take my money, and you've had all this stuff that you could have given the whole population of your country. Why didn't you share it with us? Not well, to mention that we've been using fossil fuels uh, and ruining our planet. our planet. Yeah, and what would happen is the people that would be responsible for um, making those statements. That would be their last year in office. They'd all be gone. It would be um, – I also don't believe that if they were to tell the population of the earth that uh, extraterrestrials are here and they have been visiting, that it would be any – big deal to the people on the earth because I think everybody almost knows that intuitively. What they don't know is what have you been hiding from us? How could it have made my life better? Maybe my little kid wouldn't have died uh, in that uh, lightning storm that we had because he needed an iron lung. Or maybe, you know, there's all these different scenarios and everybody on the face of the earth would be pissed. That would not be good. <laughs> everybody, well, not if you're a politician. No, everybody, everybody at that point would be voted out of office and talk about chaos. There wouldn't be chaos telling them that extraterrestrials were visiting. There'd be chaos when we – when we um, or when somebody figures out that they've been hiding – those interesting technologies from us that would save lives. Well, you know, it's, I agree. And I think also that that is why, you know, right now, the biggest statement being made relevant to the Nimitz sightings and experiences and the Roosevelt sightings and experiences not to mention all the others that have been reported by vessels that don't have a ship, a Tic Tac that was there. They have multiples that are watching the entire training sessions, but that's beside the point. 
you know, now we're being told that this is a national security threat. That's why we're getting all the money. We can't stop these things from coming here. We can't do anything with them when we take off and try to intercept them because our F-18 interceptors can't keep up even on a good day. So now national security threat is the new keywords, are the new keywords. And that is what the new focus is. That's the whole reason behind TTSA. That's the whole reason behind, you know, the contract, the the CRAD that they just got with um, the Army. Because now these are a national security threat, a global security threat, and we're going to have to find a way to stop them. Or at least interact with them in such a way that they don't pose a threat. So now they're being made into the enemy and... That's a whole different ball game. So, yeah, now now they're going to be the bad guys, and we're going to have to find a way to take them out. That's the new thing. Yeah, um, uh, it's just um, uh, a backwards way of doing things, since many many people already know that yes. there's a certain portion of the government that has been cooperating with them. Yes, for decades. Yep. So, well, and maybe longer. Well, yeah. Well, I would say yeah. But okay. Well, those are those questions, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about your new research. Okay. I mean, um, I am so excited because what you're doing is just brilliant yeah you have found yet another way to go about analyzing the different experiences because if i keep talking about aliens and interaction and stuff i would be very much in trouble probably so (laughs) (laughs) oh yes because sherry and chat just said the earthquake thing so yeah yeah, it is a big thing. But... Okay, so um, my idea was to prove that um, there are collections of UFO sightings in and around earthquakes because there's a tremendous amount of energy released by the Earth during an earthquake, um, even by small quakes, uh, uh, little ones. So – um, what I did to um, to uh, look at this entire situation is on the map of the of the U.S. I put um, dots where U.S. quakes above 4.5 occurred. Okay. So that's that's my first map, um, and they ha- happen to be pretty much centered across the western U.S., which is no surprise. Then um, I wanted to see if there was any relationship to the fault lines and where they occurred. So on a second map, I have the fault lines that occur within the United States. On the third map, what I did was – I, I took each particular event um, with an earthquake above four and a half, marked it on the map, and also marked um, where the smaller quakes from uh, uh, two to four and a half occurred. Okay. And um, basically because I just didn't know what I was going to be finding. All right? So – I put all of those on a map. Then I went into my database and marked on a database uh, groups of time, whether it was uh, before the the, uh, first quake occurred, the day of that quake, and uh, several days after that quake occurred. And I was curious to see if um, ships were collecting 
around the event on the day of the quake and the day and and after, or if they were aware that there were quakes that that were going to to come up, uh, uh, going to occur in particular areas, if they collected there, I had no idea where they're going to be collecting. So I put that down, and um, initially I used a uh, five day period for okay. two before, day off, and two after. Um, I'll give you one of my findings here. One of the things I found is in the first map, I saw the sightings across the, uh, predominantly across the eastern United States, occurred for this five-day event in straight lines. Remember I talked about that before? Yes. They occurred yeah. in straight lines because I only included five days. So I, I then went back to all of my maps and added two more days before and two days after. So I was looking at four days before, day of, and four days after then. Mm -hmm. In the majority of the maps, I found the straight lines continued, but in some of them, I noticed that the the lines were uh, starting to um, um, a zigzag on me. That maybe what they were doing was looking across uh, some latitude line, and then it got into a different period of time when it jumped up to a different latitude, and those were the sightings. Then that's what I found: um, straight lines. And in some cases, they became jagged. Then um, I went from every single event um, where the earthquakes were above four and a half. And there were 23 of them between 2003 and 2014. And I put those in maps and did the exact same thing. X'd out where the small quakes occurred, looked at where the sightings happened to be, and looked for straight lines, and looked to see where the majority of the sightings were. If they happened to be on um, quakes that were about to occur, like in the next two days, or quakes that were going to occur like within the next six months. So I saw all kinds of groups of sightings in areas that had high activity, and, but not wow. so much, not so much in the areas where the uh, quakes occurred, the heavy quakes occurred, except when I got to um, um, the area around um, St. Louis which is the New Madrid Fault that had an incredibly large quake happen back in the 1800s. Matter of fact, one that was so big, it was felt in Boston. So it was a biggie. Yeah. And, uh, and there's occasional activity around the New Madrid Fault um, that did not correspond to any of the quakes. Well, I thought that really? was it. Yeah. And then there was one quake that occurred in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you remember that. It it cracked the Washington Monument. And they had to close it down for, mm -hmm. I don't know, eight weeks or whatever they did. Uh, I saw a whole lot of, um, of uh, sightings around that particular event in Virginia. So it occurs in uh, some quakes. It doesn't occur in other quakes. And um, many of them are related to major faults. So that's, that's where I am at this point. Uh, and I haven't put them all together or compared one to the other um, versus uh, uh, 
uh, small quakes and and large amount of sightings, uh, but there's a whole lot of more um, correlation to be done on these. There's a whole lot of it. There's just so much information to go through for that, isn't there? Uh, yeah, and uh, one of the things that I noticed as uh, <clears throat> as I did these, I did um, 46... 50, I did 52 maps with either earthquake um, notations around a certain date or sighting locations. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have to include those in my book somehow or another. I don't know how I'm going to do it uh, because they're in color. So I'm either going to have to charge $70 for a book or uh, do it myself <laughs> and try to keep the cost down. That's just incredible, but though. There's a lot of information. But anyhow, one of the things I noticed is the, the San Andreas Fault and the New Madrid Fault in the St. Louis area. Right. Um, I, have, I need more research on that because I am seeing a tremendous amount of small quakes in these areas. Tremendous. Uh, also seeing quakes in southwest Montana. What the hell is that all about? Seriously? <laughs> really? What, why? Yeah. Um, now, this happens to be fairly close to Yellowstone. Right. And Yellowstone is the supervolcano. Yes, it is. So I don't think they're related, but they could be. Maybe there's a fault that runs up through there um, from, from um, Yellowstone. I don't know, but I have to do more research in there. Um, there's a bunch of quakes occurring in Nevada in western and northeastern Nevada. And they aren't on any major fault lines that I've been able to see. So How I'm going to have to like Mount St. Helens in that that region. Oh, Mount St. that's in Washington, right? Right. Yeah, that's up quite a ways. But uh, but those fault lines tend to run a good ways too. Uh, at times. Now, the San Andreas Fault goes up to Northern California, then goes out to sea. Mm -hmm. And the area goes out to sea is the Juan de Fuca Plate, which is a subduction plate that goes under the uh, North American Plate. And that is primarily responsible for all of the mountains and um, – uh, mountains and volcanoes that are found in Washington and Oregon. I think there's 14 um, still in Washington and there's 43 in Oregon. So there's a whole lot of action going on off the coast of Oregon and Washington that is reflecting on Oregon and Washington itself. Um then I have to look at uh, on the on the California coast. There's the area where the um, um, where the the Navy had all those UFO sightings, mm -hmm. and um, right off of there, there is uh, a magnetic anomaly map that one of my friends uh, pointed out to me, and. Right in that area is the area where all the sightings occurred with the Navy. There's really? got to be there got to be something there. Uh, so that's fascinating. Now, uh, small fracking quakes in Oklahoma. There's a ton of them uh, of uh, quakes that are done because of fracking. Um, this doesn't have any correlation that I can tell with UFO sightings. Um, now, see, that surprises me. Now, the, uh, there's also some areas in central California, um, not on the San Andreas Fault, on some of the sub-faults that run parallel to it, uh, up towards the mountains in uh, California that uh, involve um, uh, liquefaction. That's the liquefying of the earth whenever there's um, a major quake. 
it would be involved with uh, sucking in uh, large buildings and just swallowing them. Right. And that is also in the um, Seattle area, but really north of Seattle. And there's, a, there's some areas there that, that have been hit with so many uh, small quakes and uh, the possibility of liquefaction that they don't even allow um, building to go on there. Wow. That's up north of Seattle. Yeah. And th- there's all this weird stuff that's occurring in the United States. I would never have known unless I was doing this research on them. And I got to look into it again and try to correlate all this stuff and put it together in some sort of comprehensive manner. And it's going to be a nightmare. This is crazy. Yeah. I mean, this is absolutely crazy stuff. This is, this is just, you're going to be working on this for months. Yes, I am. Or years. Yep. yep. And when I do a book. This, did you anticipate uh, this level of. No, no. I, I, I thought it was going to be interesting because I thought. Initially, I was going to find that every major earthquake had a whole ton of sightings around it. It's not what I found. Right. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, why is everybody, and I, what I mean by everybody, I'm, a whole lot of people say that UFOs gather around earthquakes because so much energy is released. Well, that's not what I'm finding. So where are they and why? What is their draw? Yeah, it is a happy. I think their draw is when we're idiots. Well, uh, yeah, that too. Um, But um, I think that a lot of the smaller quakes in um, the San Andreas Fault, uh, especially in down in Southern California, when it goes across the uh, across the border into the Baja area, Mm -hmm. that there's more quakes there than I've than I see in San Andreas. It, it's it's nuts there. There's so many. I don't That's even know. That's interesting because we don't ever hear that. I, I know. Well, yeah, the small ones. Uh, um, are the scorpions going to complain? You know. Well, yeah. Uh, but I mean, the, but Baja is actually pretty populated as far as coastal sides. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about the interior, but I do know that Baja California is actually people love there. That just is that blows my mind. You would think that we would hear something because there's a large U.S. population that buys. They have vacation homes down there. Mm-hmm. You would think that we would hear something. Yep. Oh, I do need to let people know you're listening to WBHMDB out of Birmingham, Alabama, but. You know, I am just mesmerized by the things that you're not finding because I had been told by people that spoke with great authority that this was the case. Yeah. Um, well, as have you. I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm not saying that it isn't the case. What I'm saying is the database does not indicate that it's the case. Right. That's about all that I can say at this point. Well. You- that your research is not yet supporting that. Yes. Yes. This is astounding. I love your work. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't. Oh, well, that's because you're the one doing it. I just get to enjoy the end of it. <laughs> but, you know, it. this is why, for those listening, I am always talking about what a great author and researcher Tom Comwell is. I I just think that if I read something that he has written, if I hear him talking about something that he has found, you can pretty much take that to the bank. Period. I would His, hope. I I trust you implicitly. And you know these books they are here, volumes one, two, and three are full of information. And, yeah, you know, I cannot wait until you get 
the, everything compiled for this and get this this earthquakes book out because you know I love I love plate tectonics. I think that it's fascinating. I think that it's just interesting if you go back into historic opinions on how they separated and spread out and how they're still so active. And I really was expecting you to say, I'm finding all this stuff. Well, because so many people have said it, as I said, with great authority, yeah. where are you, where is your next phase going to be? What are you going to be looking at next relevant to this? Um, I, uh, I honestly can't see beyond this book because this one is going to take me months. Um, and I, I also don't know what I'm going to uncover along the way that's going to send me off on a tangent doing something different. Well, this is actually, that's actually what I meant. You know, you, okay. you're looking at this, you're, you're experiencing unexpected results and, where do you look next relevant to this topic? I mean, where where does your thought process go with this? Okay. Well, um, I'm going to have to take all 23 um, uh, large earthquake events and put it in some sort of a matrix of some sort and compare um, – whether uh, there are UFO sightings around the event, um, down from the event, like like down downstream in a, in a different section of the fault, mm -hmm. if they're in a whole different fault in the in the U.S., I'm just going to have to look at all of the different things and see if this reveals anything to me. Um, I may end up looking at something that I never expected to look at too, mm -hmm. just often. The wilderness. I have no idea what I'm going to find. Um, Isn't that the reason you do it, though? Because you just love the search. Yeah, well, a part of it. Part of it. Um, um, I'm also going to have to solve a problem because all of my maps are eight and a half by eleven, and I can't put them in oh, a. No, you need the great in a one. six by eight book, you know. So I'm going to have to make a big one. And they're all, and the maps are in color, so I'm going to have to include that in color and incorporate it with all the stuff that I've written about them, and um, I'll mix them in with my maps and create some sort of binder on them. So I, I've got another big problem to try to to try to solve, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. Well, I know one thing: you'll solve it. I have no um, doubt whatsoever. I hope. You know that we're almost out of time. And people need um, to know how to find you. And your okay, books. Well, okay. Um, the books can be found on Amazon. They are here, volume one, two, and three. Also, another book I've written is Going Interstellar, which we didn't even talk about tonight. We did not. Um, and what's interesting about that book is um, my friend, Kat Hobson, wrote the forward for that. Yes, she did. <laughs> Which was kind of <laughs> cool. And um, she thinks you're kind of cool. That was a uh, that was a pretty interesting book. Um, That's was, a great book. It was really a collection of blogs, mm -hmm. but I wrote about each and every as uh, aspect of the kind of physics that a extraterrestrial civilization must have been able to solve in order to get here, and. Uh, conversely, it also looks at what we have to do to solve those points and, and um, what we may have been uh, doing along the way. So that, that's, uh, that's the fourth book, Going Into Stellar, Problems First. And um, uh, this book is, again, about um, earthquakes and, and UFO sightings and if there's a correlation between the two. Um, Again, at this point, preliminary information tells me there. I don't think that there is, but I haven't looked at everything yet. Um, and after that, uh, 
I have been um, writing a book about, um, and that's this this book is partly done, uh, looking at very unusual UFO sightings around the uh, country, and um, talking about the technology that must be available um, to the uh, extraterrestrial to solve those things. So it, that that book is going to follow shortly after the Quake book is done, which might be quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be waiting patiently with my toes tapping. So, And everyone in chat has said that you are just brilliant. This was a great show. I agree with them. I think you are so interesting. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me again. Um, uh, are people welcome to uh, contact me on Facebook? Yes. Uh, Tom.conwell.3 is my Facebook address. And you will never be bored in a conversation with Tom. Promise you. And he's great at sharing information, as you've seen here. So I am just thrilled to call you friend and thrilled to have been able to have you on again. We, It had been too long. If yeah, I miss, it had been if a while. If I go too long, then I have too much information to cover for one show. Yeah. So we're going to have to do this sooner. But, and I want to let everyone know that Tom really is great at getting you answers. He will be happy to do that. And we are going to have to go. We are going to be having a great week of shows. We are back with our live shows this week. And Paranormal Pride is Monday. I will be back on Wednesday on Paranormal Experience with Kat Hobson with Robert Solomon. We will have the Paraversal Universe and Ghost Talk Radio on Friday. And I will be back next week with Dennis Stone. We will be talking America Stonehenge on Fate. So thank you so much for being here. Y'all are the reason that we do these shows. And I appreciate every single one of you. All the support, the ideas for shows, the contact information for people you'd like to hear. Y'all are awesome. And thank you very much for your support. And Tom, I hope you had fun and I hope you'll come back and that you have a great week. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks, Kat. Great to be on with you. And uh, um, I'll be on whenever you ask me. Thank you. All right, guys, y'all go. Have a great week. And you know what? Be the change you want to see. It's possible. Make your week perfect. Choose every day when you get up that this is going to be a great day, that you're going to be the kind of friend that you would love to have. And it'll happen. It does. Thank you again. I will talk to you soon. Good night.